Hello everyone and welcome to the Virtual Classroom Coach, a place for us all to learn and share best practice around everything related to online classrooms. Now in this video it's episode 2 of Bingo View, yes the show where interview meets bingo. So every now and again I interview a fellow L&D professional and pose some interesting questions about virtual classrooms, as well as the wider world of L&D. Now last episode it was the mighty Debbie Bezik Lawrence who set off the series in stunning style. Now each guest that takes part has an L&D bingo board that they have never seen at all and under each square lies an LED word or phrase, and the challenge is for them to say as many of these as possible so we can remove the squares. As with usual bingo, there's prizes to be won. Right, so let's see who my next victor, I mean, guest is. Okay, so here we are, episode two of Bingo View. Who is our special guest? I'm going to let her in from contestants row right now. So here she is, she's on her way. Very exciting. Who can it be? Heather McClinton. Hello, how are you today? I'm great, thank you. How are you? Very well, thank you, Heather. I have to say, it's just brilliant to have you as my second contestant on Bingo View. A big warm welcome to you. I am so excited to play. Like, literally, I've been looking forward to this all day. <laughs> oh, well, thank you for agreeing to come on. It's brilliant to have you. Just to remind you about how, how the game works, because it's an, in, it's an L&D interview meets bingo, OK? So we had Debbie on uh, last time. She was our very first contestant. She scored 10 points. Now, the way you do this is by really saying any phrase or, or word that's connected to L and D, okay? And on this very bingo board you can see here, there's a special word or phrase linked to L and D behind it, okay? The more you say, the more squares I can reveal at the end, okay? Now, there are prizes to be won. Here they are. Any one line gets you this gorgeous notebook for all your doodles and thoughts. Reveal the four corners and you get this fabulous piece of VCC pottery. Reveal six or more squares and you automatically get this tea. And then you two can nonchalantly lean against railings. If railings aren't your thing, how about a wall in this fabulous hoodie? It's a big ask though, you need a full house for this one. I am so excited. I feel a bit of pressure now, I'm not going to lie, 10 is a good score and I really want to get my hands on these prizes, so fingers crossed. Well, do you know what? Let's go for this. Let's see how far we can go. Let's get Debbie off that top spot. She'll be furious. <laughs> all right, so question number one for you then is, Heather, first of all, I know you very well. I've worked with you for many years now, but for everybody else, who exactly are you and what is your role? Um, so my name is Heather and I am currently an instructional learning designer. Um, so that means that I am responsible for the design part of the training cycle. We know that very well, don't we, Richard? We do. <laughs> and um, I currently sort of write scripting for videos, online learning, um, and create learning interventions within adult learning. So that Gosh, is me. that sounds a huge role. So literally any type of intervention you're involved in? Yeah, so we can be responsible for face-to-face -face sort of classroom training, and um, we can do scripting for videos and doing some storyboards around those, which is like one of my favourite things to do. Um, and we do sort of online learning as well, so your virtual classrooms, um, and you've got sort of your e-modules, 
So yeah, I think that I've been really excited to get involved in this virtual classroom coaching. So do you know a little bit about that? You certainly do. Well, you see, I, I, I've seen you deliver, Heather, uh, many times in the past. And, you know, what I've always admired about you is, is your sheer creativity in, in how you can bring learning to life uh, for the learners and make it exciting. Um, has that helped you in your current role out of interest? Oh, yeah, 100%. So... I think some of my colleagues would probably describe me as the mad hatter of the team because I love an out there idea and I'm not afraid to try a new approach. I think even when you think something seems a little bit wacky or a bit, you know, you're sort of unsure of how it would be received, you know, my advice to your listeners would be always just go for it, you know, put that out on the table and discuss it with your peers because I think, you know, there's always a little bit of magic in, the, in those moments of madness, so totally go for them. Um, but I think, you know, that experience of being in the classroom and working along, alongside our audience that we're trying to reach um, has really helped me move into this design role because I know sort of what works and what doesn't. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we know there's no right or wrong way to learn, but it's sort of that time with our learners has helped me sort of understand what their preferences is and uh, what preferences are and sort of what um, works within a classroom environment versus what would be better online that sort of you know getting that mix right um, so yeah I think it's been really really helpful to have that that experience interesting okay and how important to you is it for, for adult learning to be fun <gasps> so so important like I would say it's probably one of the most important things. I agree. Yeah, like learning, we learn throughout our whole entire lives, don't we? You know, some people think that it stops at school or university and they associate it with this sort of lecture classroom environment, which is, as we know, you learn like every single day without even realising. Like I'm a massive fan of just Googling how to do basically everything in life. I don't know how I survive without it. Um, but you can, you know, you've got sort of YouTube, you've got things that, you know, at your fingertips, you learn and how to put new appliances together, you learn every day in your career, you know, it helps you sort of progress and get where you want to be. So I think, you know, making those little experiences as fun, as easy and as accessible as possible is absolutely crucial in the world of L&D today. Mm. I suppose, in a way, we're, we're all accessing interactivity in terms of learning now, aren't we, as well? You know, in, in all sorts of ways, you know, like I say, video uh, modules, um, collaborative pieces. I don't know, it all seems really interactive these days. It's not just that old sit down and listen through a lecture anymore. Exactly. I'm like, don't know about you, because, I mean, I said there's no right or wrong way to learn. Some people mm. love learning this way. Yeah, I guess, yeah. My idea of hell is someone giving me, like, a 200-page user guide manual on how to do something. Yeah. Like, that fills me with dread, because it's so passive. You're just reading. It's hard to, I find it personally hard to engage with that much content just in one go. You know, it's all about, like, as you said, collaborating, sharing ideas, discussing different parts. I think that is how we actually learn and how, how we remember it as well. It creates a memorable experience. Uh, I agree. I think learning should always be fun so that it's interactive and so that it's engaging. And, and my rule is learning should be childlike but never childish. And if you can do that, you know, by having games, uh, activities, uh, little competitions, quizzes, then that keeps the interactivity and the fun and the engagement going. I completely agree. I think it's that balance that you've got to get right. And sort of speaking from my own experience, it's not always easy to get mm. that right. I've been known to go a bit too crazy and I have to get reins in. <laughs> but I think, yeah, whatever your audience, whatever your audience is, you know, um, we're all adults. Um, and obviously you could be possibly um, teaching people at different levels in, a, in an organisation. You know, you could be working with okay. local newbies to... Um, managers or owners of a business you know directors that type of level and I think no matter where you're trying to pitch it a little bit of play always goes a long way <laughs> love that is, did you just make that up or is that is that something you go by Heather 
Um, I think I just made that up on the spot because I realised it was going to rhyme. But at the same time, I totally like live my life that way and I bring that into my job every single day. So a bit of both. <laughs> Copyright Heather McClinton. I love that phrase. I'm going to proudly pinch that myself. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next question for you then. Um, do you have a, a specific area of expertise or specialism? Ooh, I would probably say, um, linked to sort of what we've just been talking about again, it would be sort of my creativity. I would say that, yeah. And something, yeah, I really believe in is um, it's a really sought after skill actually at the moment. There's probably loads of research and content out there on this, but it's creative problem solving. And it is sort of what it says on the tin. So it's about how you can creatively overcome um, any sort of problems that you're facing and come up with a solution that is maybe new, outside the box, and something that you've not tried before ever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's, it's a really fun process to work from. But as I said, it, it just gives you, it sort of stops any limitations really, or stops you from writing anything off so for example what I mean by that is you could come up with an idea that you think is like really fab and fun but you're like but that would never work or I, I think that's just you know too too out there it's not legit we, we couldn't do that it takes that sort of blockage away wow so, you know you could consider all different possibilities and look at okay things that might seem maybe a little bit irrational at first yeah but you can actually bring that into the real world and come up with a really fun solution that would work for your business so creative problem solving and and just approaching things i think in that way is probably what i really advocate with my colleagues um, sounds like removing barriers and being more open in your thinking exactly that you know and that's not always a natural thing for people. That's not a natural process. It's not, it might not come naturally to them. So if you actually research the creative problem solving process, it almost gives you some pointers and some tips to think about to help you open your mind even further. So there's tons of research out there on it. Um, if anyone's ever interested in giving that a go. But I think, yeah, it, it's a really, a really interesting way to work. Cool. Well, may, maybe you could share any of your favourite links. We could put them in the description below in case anybody wants to investigate that. Would that be OK? Of course. Yeah, that's cool. Brilliant. Thank you very much. OK, great. All right. So let's think about virtual classrooms then. How do you have to think differently when you're designing for that environment compared to, say, a bricks and mortar classroom? Ooh. OK. So... Um, definitely from a design point of view, there are different considerations for the virtual world. Okay. Um, things that, so ooh, where do I start with this question? <laughs> and I'm trying to get my most like L and D jargon in there because I keep thinking of this bingo game at the back of my mind. <laughs> I'd say, um, first of all, one of the things that you've really got to consider is um, the number of people that you're trying to reach because I think even in both scenarios, even in a, you know, a classroom face-to-face -face environment, the number of people that you're working with is going to affect how you're going to communicate your points mm. and how interactive you can be with that as well. Obviously, the more people that you have, the slightly more challenging it is to bring in different interactions. And um, so that's something I think you've always got to consider right at the beginning. And then sort of link to that building onto it is once you have um you know distilled what it is exactly um you're trying to get across and those points that you want to make i think in the virtual classroom you've got to be extremely clear about how you then communicate those because obviously in face to face or you know something sort of like this where we can see each other now you've got body language you've got expressions you know, you can um, you can read when someone's not quite understanding something and when to revisit it. Whereas in the virtual world or online, you don't always have that luxury. So those points that you are making, they've got to be communicated as clearly and as simply as possible. Um, just so that you're not causing any confusion um, and there's no um, opportunities for things to be misread because you haven't got those visual cues to go off. 
I absolutely 100% agree with you on that one. As somebody that delivers virtuals, that need for clarity is, is so much more important on a virtual and that need for um, efficiency in the words used as well because you know you haven't always got a full day you've got two or three or four hours uh, with your learners so completely agree with you on that point it has to be really well written for that reason uh, you know really well crafted for me definitely I think like you said the time that you've got with your audience in the online world is much much shorter you know, when you have a face-to-face -face sort of classroom or face-to-face -face training event, um, it often takes place over a full day. Yeah. Um, you know, possibly even a number of days, depends on how your organisation runs things. Um, but in a virtual world, time is of the essence. Because you could have the most exciting, like amazing, unbelievable virtual classroom experience of your life, but no one wants to sit in front of the computer all day. Um, it doesn't matter how interactive it is, they will get bored, they will get distracted. Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, we are all human beings. So you have to yeah, make that time much shorter. Um, my advice would probably say like 90 minutes to maybe two hours max with some breaks in there. I don't know what you think, Richard, is the ideal time for a virtual classroom? Yeah, I agree with you. I think two hours is absolutely fine um with with even with a break a, a 10 minute break from the screen um i think there's nothing wrong with longer ones as long as you have breaks that are relative to to, to the, the length of the course as well so for example there's nothing wrong with a session being say four or five hours but what i'd love is um maybe split into two with a nice hearty lunch in between maybe some breaks in between the other sections as well um, and I think it's because, like you say, it's, it's very passive, sat there in front of a screen. Yes, the brain is active, but the body is very passive. So it's only right to give people a chance to finish stretching their minds and stretch their bodies and to actually have a break from the constraints of a screen as well. Exactly. I think, yeah, you hit the nail on the head there, that if you do need to do um, a longer virtual, then consider, like, you know, having it either side of lunch. So does that really... That, you know, long break where someone gets up, they move, they go and have something to eat and they come back in like a fresher state of mind. Yeah. And um, I think that makes a difference. Or even just when you're saying then about, you know, virtuals being passive, it reminded me of the time I did this completely crazy icebreaker to a variety of like high profile stakeholders, um, which they at the time probably thought that I had lost the plot, but it actually, they all got involved and it started off our virtual really well. Um, it was a bit of brain gym. So we did a bit of an, I think, you know, an icebreaker at the beginning, which I'm sure we'll get to later is like so important. Um, but we did a bit of brain gym as an icebreaker. Have you ever heard of brain gym before? I certainly have, yeah. Would you mind explaining it for anyone that hasn't? Well, I started to think it was like a regional thing in Liverpool because every time I brought brain gym up, people are like, what on earth are you on about? Um, but it's like little exercises that you can do which basically engage different areas of your brain. So you're coming into a meeting or a learning experience with like your full brain, left and right, everything activated and ready to go. And it's just doing like simple little like coordination, like movements and stuff. Um, but they're active and you know you can even get up on your feet for some of them so I actually had you know these high profile stakeholders like some of them were like in the car parked obviously with engine off but they were in the car and they're doing all these crazy actions and it was a really good laugh but it, it, it was a creative meeting that we were going into so like it was completely appropriate and it really just set the tone broke the ice and got everyone ready to come up with ideas so it worked really well yes yeah, so, so it got their minds engaged it got them thinking creatively as well I, I love that in fact i've done a video on the on the virtual classroom icebreakers as well so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll put a link to that somewhere here now for everyone to look at that if they want to <laughs> investigate other virtual classroom icebreakers as well i'm going to add to those as well so maybe heather if you can think of any others we could even do a joint video on virtual classroom icebreakers in the future yeah. We so could uh, try and ask them out. <laughs> we'll good. try them out for the listeners and see what they think. Hey, that sounds good fun. I'm all for that. Yeah. I'm involved with that 100%.
For but real. yeah, it just makes you think that it doesn't always have to be a passive experience, you know. Yeah. You can do yoga, you know, behind your computer screen or behind your laptop. Loads of people do that with like fitness videos on YouTube and things. So mm. it is still possible to move behind a screen. Um, and I think, you know, maybe consider that sometimes when trying to create your own virtual classrooms. Yeah, yeah. Talking of screens then, uh, ju just a question I'd like to throw at you. What's your thoughts on participants and video? Uh, for you, if you were a facilitator online, would you expect to see participants sharing their video or is it optional for you? Ooh, I think um, it, it is always an optional thing. You know, we never want to force anybody to do anything that they will feel uncomfortable with. Um, in, in any learning environment so whether you know this is face to face whether this is online and virtual but I do believe that there are huge benefits to people actually sharing their camera um, and actually being able to you know see who they're working with and put a face to the name and um, because it just gives you that sense of collaboration more so I think if you can see who you're talking to um, again you can possibly um, if you're in that sort of group size where you can all share your cameras and share your video and see each other, um, it can actually add some of those verbal cues that I said can often be missed within a virtual world. And um, so you will actually have people's body language and things that you can judge, whether that's from you know a facilitation point of view um, to help you sort of get the best experience for those learners, or whether that is from a learner point of view and actually understanding how their peer is maybe you know engaging in that conversation or discussion that they're having um, so I think it, it is an optional thing it's something that I know in my job I don't force people to put their cameras on um, but I often add a note into our tutor notes to say you know to encourage it mm. um, and, and to try and you know maybe to make it less daunting maybe you know bring it into your icebreaker or make it a bit of a game or something just so people are feeling a little bit more comfortable with actually putting their cameras on brilliant yeah thank you i mean I, I'm, I'm torn at the moment because i've seen some recent research from ofcom that says nine out of ten adults um don't trust video on computers so you know and, and you've heard of people covering their cameras up with stickers and things like that so there is a bit of reticence with some people to share their videos online so I, I definitely get that if that's how people feel that's how people feel but also from a facil facilitator's point of view it's sort of um i don't know it's really strange if you see a black screen all the way through a session and you know it, and um, like, in fact, I speak to Debbie Basic Lawrence offline after we'd done our video uh, a few weeks ago, and, and she said to me, You know what? If you think of a bricks and mortar, you wouldn't allow somebody to sit there with a, a black bag over their heads. You'd <laughs> want to see their faces. And, and you know, should, should that not apply online as well? So I'm currently torn. So you're right, at the end of the day, our, our learners have to feel comfortable, otherwise, they don't learn. Do you know what I think could be like a nice compromise almost with that is um i'm just having this light bulb moment now myself it's quite often um as a designer you know and as a facilitator we encourage people to put those cameras on right mm. from the beginning and i don't know if you agree with me here but when you are first joining a virtual classroom you know and you're potentially coming into a virtual world with strangers people that you've not met yet it can be a bit daunting yeah to just and yeah. be like hey this is me and you know you don't really know who else is there so why I think something that we could consider is actually once you've maybe done a couple of icebreakers or you've had some discussions maybe encourage people to switch the cameras on later in the session because they might then feel a little bit more comfortable and familiar of okay I'm feeling a bit more comfortable with the content now I sort of know what we're going to cover I've actually already spoken to x y and z and i actually know this person didn't know they were going to be here but i yeah. know them so they might actually feel a little bit better to then you know put the video on and be like hey yeah so start with dipping their toe in the water and then move it forward sort of thing ease them into it especially yeah. if you've got an audience who are brand new to the virtual world i think maybe trying that approach of just easing them into it will create a more um, relaxed environment. Yes, 
So they first arrive, that they get that feeling of safety and security. Like I say, they see that there's other people there, people they may know as well, then move it on to the next stage. All right, let's all try sharing our cameras. You're right, it'd be great for new audiences, wouldn't it? Any organisation that's new to virtuals as well. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I might have to try that myself. So I'm thinking, no, I might write that down. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so a question for you then. What top piece what top three pieces of advice would you give to a learning designer who was suddenly in a position of having to write for the virtual classroom Ooh. panic no, panic <laughs> panic look at loose, 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 loose. No. Um, <laughs> it's not actually that scary i think if you know you've never written virtually before it can feel a little bit frightening and you know you could be really confidence of speaking from experience here I was really confident in the classroom mm. environment and with face-to-face -face training because that's my background so suddenly when the need for virtuals was certainly in higher demand it can be a little bit daunting to think well how do these things transition across or how do I make this work and um, I'd say sort of my top three bits of advice for anyone new to write in virtual classrooms and um, sort of links into a little bit about what I said earlier is number one is consider the size of your audience. Okay. Okay, because that is massively going to affect sort of the style that you write in, as well as the interactions that you're going to be able to include. So if you have a smaller group, say of about 20 participants, um, then you're able to make that online experience a lot more collaborative, bring in interactions, you know, have possible breakout rooms where they'll go into little groups and have those independent discussions. I think you have, you know, facilitation wise, a, a lot more options and definitely the time and luxury to have more interactions into what you design. Whereas if you're dealing with larger numbers, so I'm talking about, um, let's go the other end of the scale, say like over a hundred plus people maybe that you're trying to reach what you'll probably find is that your um, style is a lot more informative and that interactions are limited because if could you imagine like 250 people trying to stamp something on the screen yeah, <laughs> the yeah. Room, chaos yeah it's going to go into total chaos so again you're probably going to be taking a more informative approach and probably won't be able to um interact with them maybe as often or as in many ways as you would like to um, but again, it's going to get that message across much clearer for that size audience. Mm -hmm. So number one is think about yet yeah, how many people are you trying to reach or how many people are going to be on these virtual classrooms. And then um, sort of link to that number two is to think about, again, what we said before, the time. Now, to figure out how long you think your virtual classroom should be and whether you're going to do it is like episodes or a series, or you just want to keep it that short and sweet, 90 minutes with a coffee break virtual. Um, it's really important to think about obviously your content and what it is that your, you know, what your aim is, what you're trying to achieve and what your objectives are within that time limit as well. So a really good way to do that um, is you've got to be super 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 concise about those points that you want to make you want to filter out any possible waffle or like nice to know bits of information you know nice to know things are just that they're nice to know mm -hmm. but if they're not crucial in completing that objective i would say in your virtual world maybe just push those to one side for a little bit for now because they can appear somewhere else as well can't they yeah like the jigsaw you yeah like you know an infographic or a website that they go and check out if they want to know more but you've just got to be super clear and super concise around those objectives and what you want to achieve in that given time so you can see obviously how they link depends on how much you've got to cover once you've got your objectives will obviously affect how long um, or however episodes or series you know your virtual classroom needs to be um, something that we use in my team currently is a process called action mapping. I don't know, have you ever heard of action mapping? No, that's new to me. So action mapping, it comes from Kathy Moore. Again, I can put this in the links in terms of helpful resources and Thank stuff. Thank you. This um, little video. But um, action mapping is a process that helps you 
um, really get down to the nitty gritty and essential points of what you want to achieve. So you have your business goal in the middle, okay? You have sort of potential barriers. So what are your obstacles that are currently stopping you from hitting this business goal? And then what is it you need your learners to be able to do? So not know, or it's like, what do you need them to physically be able to do to achieve your business goal? And then sort of at the very, very end of the process is when you get to, okay, what do my learners need to know? So what are the crucial bits of information that they must just be informed or know about to be able to complete those tasks? And what that does is it filters out all of those lovely little bits of extra information that as learning designers, as facilitators, we love to pack in and we love to try and you know, teach people as much as we can in a really sort of short time. It helps us just sort of pull back a little bit on those and just really zoom in on those crucial points that are going to help you achieve your goal. Because, because you could pack it with all those other nice to know stuff, you could, but then that degrades the learning experience, doesn't it? Yeah, like, do you want me to give you an example of like yeah. a nice to know that I see all the time? And I've even, probably I've done it as well, like I'm not criticising people who have done this, but now after following the action mapping process, it really makes me laugh. So it could be you're trying to um, complete a piece of learning, whether that's virtual or in the classroom, maybe on a product, um, on a service that, that you know, somebody offers. Um, and it always starts off with the history. And you get the life story of when this product came about and the year that it was invented. And how that, I think when you think about if your business goal was to sell that product, you are never really going to have a conversation with a, a customer or a client that goes, did you know this was made in 1984? By <laughs> it's not like, it's nice to know, but it is not crucial information. <laughs> so things like that is sort of what I'm talking about, you know, in this scenario, using action mapping help you, helps you sort of filter that out and just get down to the detail, the essential learning points. That you need to include in your virtual classroom. And like you said, because it's time critical, a virtual, it's, I guess it's more important than to do, to do the action mapping than ever before. Yeah, completely. I think that's something that I've learned recently myself is because um, action mapping was relatively new to my team. It was something we'd only really been doing sort of the past six months. And when it came to rewriting some virtuals recently, I literally couldn't have done it without action map and it just made that process of transferring a virtual and um, a face-to-face -face piece of learning into something online it makes okay. it easier so I'd say that's probably my biggest tip for anybody who's new to writing virtuals or who's even written some before but finds it you know oh they're always a bit long or I'm always really stuck on how do I know what to include action mapping is the one I keep doing that one. <laughs> I'll join in. <laughs> so, um, I've got a question for you then, based on that. Yeah, we well, us a little bit. But go on. Say again. I think I've sidetracked us a little bit from the game. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm absolutely fantastic discussion. I'm learning how to be a, a, an instructional designer as well. So this is fabulous. It's great, um, but. What about then, you've done your action mapping and you've got a great piece of learning that lasts just the right amount of time and it's hitting all the right points. And then somebody says, oh, but it'd be lovely to just have this in or that in or the other in. And you know, it's all, all of that nice to know stuff. How can you handle that? What, what, what's your way of dealing with somebody that you know, has a different viewpoint? that is probably where like your consultation skills would come in you know i think whatever your role is within l d whether that's sort of project management whether that is um delivering training uh, and facilitating training or designing it there's always that piece of co like consultancy i think yeah it happens to make sure that you are getting to the right solution and the right learning intervention so sort of just in those times and um, when that happens again this is where action mapping has really helped manage those conversations and um, because you could turn around and you could say to a stakeholder or to a colleague you know here is the clear business goal that we are wanting to achieve 
with this piece of learning so you've got that clear outcome um, in order to um, fulfill that these are the things that we need a learner to be able to do so then when it comes into if they're having a suggestion say oh it would be nice if they knew what year the product was event you know, first ever made let's come back to that example you can actually show your action map and say you know though that is you know a lovely little piece of information it's a lovely little nugget is it going to actually, you can ask that person, is it going to help them achieve that business goal that we're aiming for? And with having your action map, um, you know, either in front of you or online, you can mm. create it. By having that shared visual, it makes that conversation easier because then that person is able to actually go, oh, well, no, I can see what you mean. Now it's not. So it helps you almost, you know, fight your corner for what you think is the right solution. And it's not to say, like you said before, that these little nuggets of info are completely pointless. They, they're really good. You could do extra resources. They could be further reading, further learning for those individuals who want all the detail, because we do have some learners who are like that. Um, but it's about maybe them proposing, okay, we think that it doesn't fit perfectly within the virtual classroom, but how about we create this PDF or we create these links so that if someone does want to know that, the option is there. So you'll probably look at just how you could package things a bit differently. Yeah, I love that. And and I suppose working like that gives you confidence as well to have those conversations, doesn't it? Because you've got a plan there. You've got almost like a visual that you can share with them and say, this is our, this is what we want to achieve in this time. Anything else? Yes, we can certainly do that. But there's other ways to, to do it. And like, you know me, Richard, I am like the least assertive person ever. Well, I was anyway till I discovered action mapping, and now I'm like, no, look, like having that visual to refer to makes those conversations so much easier. And like you said, you feel more confident going into them because mm. it used to be previously a bit of like just sort of, oh, well, you know, I think it shouldn't go in there because <laughs> like there was nothing else to really back that up. So having that visual and that process to follow, um, I think just yeah makes it so much easier. All right, so another question for you, Heather. Um, brilliant advice we've had so far. I'd love you to, to tackle this one for us. There's currently lots of organisations that are now thinking of translating their, their bricks and mortar classroom training into virtual sessions instead. You know, it's great for all sorts of reasons, never mind time saving and money saving, uh, to name but two. But what advice would you give to any designer to translate? their work into a virtual piece of learning? Ooh, I think, you know, you can even look at that either way, can't you? You can almost think of this would be easier because I've already got some content to go off there. Yeah. It's a matter of remodeling that and reshaping it. Um, but at the same time, I suppose some people could look at that as more of a challenge because, as you know, face-to-face -face classroom content, there's tons of it. And it's all so, like practical and hands-on you think how could I possibly translate that into a virtual experience you know so I suppose you can look at it either way um I think my advice would be again in those sort of linking to what I said earlier is about doing still doing some action mapping on that because what that will help you do is though you've got a brilliant full day you know, face-to-face -face classroom experience there. If you action map what it is that you want to achieve, it's going to help you break that down. And again, just pull out those essential pieces of learning. So I'd say that would be your first step over what to do. And um, secondly, um, is about thinking just because this is going online doesn't mean that it's now going to be a totally passive learning experience. There is still that option to have tons of interaction between your participants. So you might just think about again, how you might you know, transfer a, a particular activity into um, something virtual. So if you've got a live demonstration, for example, in your classroom, maybe consider showing a video or mm. something that they could watch um, to, or even dem do a live demo yourself as a facilitator. Um, so that they can still see that sort of hands-on process of what happens. If you've got things like, oh, I'm trying to think of some examples. Maybe you've got an activity where a learner needs to sort things out into different boxes or categories and they're doing like a sort and 
um, list sort of activity. Again, you could do that online on a screen. Yeah share your screen you could say stamp what you know answers you think fit this bill or it could be you know actually drop and drag this over here um you could still have breakout rooms so again those really good discussions that happen when you're doing face-to-face -face learning so again it's that peer-to-peer -peer learning which i think there's so much value in that definitely that yeah, that can still happen online. You've got breakout rooms. Let them go off away from you for a second. Obviously, you can drop in and check they're okay, but let them have that time with their peers and have those discussions and come up with their own ideas um, and have them feed that back to you. So again, it's just because you're doing it online. It doesn't mean you talk for an hour and a half as a facilitator. It's still that collaborative experience. So, you know, you can just sort of, lift certain bits and bobs over but just consider how could you translate mm. those key activities into something interactive online so that you don't lose that fun and that magic that a classroom environment has i suppose it's about knowing the tools in whatever platform you're using know, knowing what tools exist and then you can think about how to use them can't you exactly i've got a question for you then Ooh, go on then so what would you say as a facilitator, as um, someone who delivers training, what would your advice be in terms of how you bring those things to life within a virtual? So if you're, what I mean is like if you're really confident um, in a face-to-face -face classroom environment and you're now being told that you have to deliver um, some online trainers, some live online, some virtuals, what sort of tips could you maybe give to um, other facilitators to really just bring that experience to life oh brilliant question you've turned it on to me now heather you little tinker goodness me okay let's have a think then let's see if i can get some squares removed as well <laughs> um, right let's have a think i think for me the most important thing is to know your own technology mm. all right so whatever platform you're using so many out there to know it inside out so you can be confident in what you're using on screen um, so yeah that confidence in the technology and whether you get that confidence through trial and error with friends and family playing games with colleagues and stuff but to, to really feel confident in the tech then for me the second piece has to be uh, knowing your notes okay again you, you've, you've mentioned about in a virtual there's no time to be wasted you know it's all really concentrated in a bricks and mortar i can pop off and look at my notes while while the group are doing something i can just look through and see what's next on a virtual i don't really have that luxury it's, it's you're broadcasting almost to your learners and you you know focuses on you so to know the notes i cannot be sat there reading through notes like this and you know going, going through you just like hold on a minute like, yeah exactly yeah. you just don't have that luxury so a technology and b know your notes and i think you should be at a stage where you can have bullet points of things you're going to say but if you need more than bullet points then you need to get to know your notes more that is so true and to be honest you would do that i think well i know i used to and i know that you do you would do that when preparing for a new classroom piece yeah. of training you would make sure, you know, you'd go over those notes so many times. You'd think of what considerations would I need to make in my environment to make that really work. And I think you've probably just got to um, have that same time to go over the virtual notes and the technology. Because I think that's one of the biggest barriers, personally, for a facility. It's that fear of the technology. Yep. Once you've got yourself comfortable with that and the notes, then really there's nothing stopping you, is there? So this could be controversial because you are a designer who writes notes for somebody like me. And, and the way, you'll have to tell me what you think about this because I always think of <laughs> notes, the facilitator's notes that you've spent hours and hours, days, weeks producing. To me, the way I look at them is those notes are for me to learn from. Um, so that's how I get to know the course, by reading and reading and rereading those notes. And then for me, those notes get put aside and I go to my own bullet pointed version of them. Um, but that's only because I'm confident in understanding what's been written for me. But from your point of view, you could think, oh, he's not using the notes I've provided. Why is he making his own? But, but they do relate directly to the notes that have been written for me. You know, what's your thoughts on that? No, I think 
you've actually brought up a really good point. Um, it's not like a careful, I'm not massively wounded to know that you bullet point my notes <laughs> because, you know, we sort of, we write in a way where we do want you to put your own spin on things. You know, this isn't making you a sort of a robot reading from a script to your learners. That's not what makes a great presenter. That's not what facilitating is all about. So we do, you know, we want you to be able to put your own spin on things and digest that information in a way that works for you. So you said in your example there that you like to bullet point the key points and you use that as your reference. Because I did that, it's much easier than trying to find where you were on a long mm. page. Whereas yeah. if you can sort of bullet point and you're like, okay, this is what's coming up next. This is what I need to prepare for. Then that works for you. I think where that goes wrong sometimes between a designer and, and delivery sort of relationship can be when people don't follow the notes. So in a sense of they'll go off and put their bullet points, but then they'll add extra pieces of information in um or as a result of or that, take something out take things out yeah yeah, yeah. So maybe that's where sometimes a bit of frustration can lie with a designer because you know i've talked you through some of the processes that we use mm. here we don't just wake up in the morning and go la 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 and do loads <laughs> of writing there is so much thought and conversations with stakeholders and work that has gone into getting those notes as to the way that they are and there is reasons why every specific point is in there so it can be heartbreaking when someone misses them out or when someone just thinks oh no i'll just do this instead <laughs> Like, no, that's not what they're for. But I think there's absolutely nothing wrong with taking what's there, putting your own spin on it so it feels like you and it matches your style of presenting. And then, yeah, bullet pointing or digesting it into whatever way works for you. So that just makes that flow of the day and that delivery a really easy experience. Yeah. On the back of that, I think uh, as a facilitator, as a trainer, I, I have a duty actually to, to, to get those notes, read them, read them and reread them and to fully understand. And, you know, f for me, there's a bit of repetition in that where I'll, I'll read the notes, I'll, I'll carry on reading them until, until it really comes to life in my head and I can see it from the designer's point of view. And for me, that's a, a duty actually. Otherwise, I can't do the piece justice. I like to think of us as a tag team you know it's sort of we're really lucky that we work in an organization and um, where we we have that relationship and we have you know that that closeness between and um, design and delivery and really follow that process through and I know not every business works that way yeah um, but I think yeah you know we're definitely a tag team and how we bring this content to life um, and we should definitely, you know, work together on, on stuff to get the right solution. And like you said, create the best possible experience. For yeah, people. I think we have to remember at the end of the day, it's all created for our learners, isn't it? Yeah, totally. It's not for us. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 All right. And so we talked about how important it is to know the technology. And, you know, even as a designer, you need to know the technology that we're using as well. So you can write for it. Um, we've, we've talked about breakout rooms already. So and we, oh, I love breakout rooms. Do you know what? The point is some of us can work in actual bricks and mortar training rooms where we don't have any space. We can't even do breakouts because we don't have space. On the, in the virtual world, we've got as many breakout room space as we want. What a luxury, <laughs> it's true. So, you know, I'm all for breakout rooms. So those aside, because we've talked about those. Do you have a favorite um, tool when it comes to virtual classrooms that you like to bring into the design oh that's a good question favorite tool i have to say i'm quite a big fan of the annotation bar because i just think you know that really gets people involved and it's a little you know the chat box is good and i think as well the chat box is safer so if you've got like this really shy group or there's people brand new to the online world, they're going to love that chat box. So, you know, make the most of it. It's a good stepping stone to those interactions. But if you want to get people really involved with the session and what you're doing, then I love the annotation tool that you have on this. So obviously that means that a learner is able to, to draw, write, stamp, um, whatever you share on the screen. So it's a great way of either you could collectively collaborate on some sort of mind map and actually make something together within a virtual session 
or you could use it um, in sort of a way of like as part of an activity where they might need to stamp in the scenario what they think mm. would be um, the best solution or do like a branching scenario from that as well. Um, you could do bring it into your icebreakers, little just fun things, just get them involved. So, you know, show me a little heart or a little stamp of what you think of this idea. Just, you know, even subtle interactions like that still have a big impact and keep people's attention. So I probably have to say, if you can, the annotation tool is always a fun one. Yeah, do you know what? I think our learners love that tool. I think there's something fascinating of, of them having that control to destroy the screen and draw all, all the sort of things they want to draw. And... One of my favourite things, now this wasn't my idea as a learning designer, so I totally can't take credit for it, but I know when I was going through this training myself, um, our trainer actually said to us, you know, they, she did an activity once where they had like blank cupcakes just not coloured in blank cupcakes on the screen and we shared them and they asked the participants using the annotate function to decorate the cupcakes so you could colour them all in you could put little heart sprinkles on there and again you know sort of almost feels like a bit of nonsense like why would we be decorating cupcakes relevant maybe if you're in a bakery business but if you're not like what's going on you but could you apply that to your organisation whatever your organisation produces yeah. you could make it relevant it doesn't have yeah. to be but even that's just a really fun and quick way of getting your learners comfortable with these tools as well so yeah. actually just be getting them to experience the different functions available and getting them comfortable with it before then maybe using that in a more business scenario spot on but but like you say it could it could be so misperceived that oh this is a waste of time why are we doing this or any onlookers could think why is that why that why is my why is my uh, colleague sat at that screen coloring in a cupcake you know <laughs> but you, you're spot on it's what you can get from it afterwards so it's worth investing in those two or three minutes of fun to then really instill confidence and bring out creativity in the rest of the session exactly you know you could use that in a nice breakaway or just like a mini energizer the same way you'd have in a classroom a little energizer before going into a virtual activity and though it's maybe just recapturing people's attention it's a bit mm. fun, you're getting them ready to use the tool that you want them to have a go of in the next scenario or activity so it's setting them up ready for you know that business piece for them to work on so what we're talking about interaction then for you is that do you have any thoughts on how much interaction there should be in a session yeah so lots <laughs> if you can lots and what i mean by if you can again it comes back to the number of people that are attending your virtual classroom if you've got large groups of like 80 plus potentially hundreds of people because let's be honest you can reach hundreds of people in one go in a virtual classroom you know it's one of the benefits of it you don't need to hire a massive event hall to reach that audience you can do it simply at your fingertips um, if you've got a large audience like that then your interaction should be kept fairly minimal otherwise like we said you are just asking for chaos okay i think maybe one of the interactions that you could maybe use there is the chat box function I think is quite handy so again if anyone has got any questions or things that they want to bring up then they can use that chat box function to interact with you but that experience will be a little bit more passive whereas if you have a group size of say up to 20 i would say you want it to be really interactive so literally every couple of minutes there should be something that that participant has to do and it doesn't mean like it has to be a full activity, but it can just be stamp this or, you know, sort of share your reaction to this scenario, um, pop your suggestions in the chat box. It can just be something quite even little, but every couple of minutes in a group size of around sort of zero to say 25, just as a random number there, every couple of minutes you want an interaction, they should be doing something to engage with you. If you're in the middle, so you're a medium sized group, let's say you're looking at 25 to 50 participants, um, then again, I think you've still got the opportunity to get some good interactions in there. Um, they might be 
slightly less frequent than in a smaller group. But again, if you're clever about it, um, you should be able to still get a good couple of interactions within a medium sized group. So again, breakout rooms could probably work really well um, and getting them to feedback. Mm. Maybe again. choosing one person to represent that breakout room to feedback. Yeah, exactly that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'd say really large group, trying as much as we want to put interactions in there because it does make a better learning experience. If you've got 400 people, even 100 people at the end of that, you know, your virtual world, try and keep them quite minimal. It will just make a much easier sort of experience and it will flow better for the people involved. If you're somewhere in the middle and um, you've got a medium sized group, um, then they won't be as frequent, but you can definitely get a good couple of interactions in there. I think that was a brilliant suggestion, Rich, about having like a, a nominated you know, spokesperson in breakout room discussions and things like that. If you've got a little group, go crazy <laughs> with relevant interactions. So every couple of minutes, your participants yeah. are doing something. <laughs> so what advice would you give to any organisation considering bringing virtual classrooms to their learning portfolio? Ooh, I would say, do it. <laughs> Well, as that, certainly give it a go. As you said before, Rich, there are just so many benefits to virtual classrooms. They are so much more cost effective. There's no travel involved. They're very accessible. Um, they're easy to actually, you know, be a part of and get involved with. Um, so I think 100% like you want to consider bringing them into your offer. I don't think you i'm not saying that they will replace every form of of training that we know you know we know that blended the learning is like a blended offer of um online face-to-face -face, mm. uh, sort of self-led learning as well um, and i think that having that mix is still really important but where you can or if you can offer it as an option i think having virtual classrooms as part of your learning offer will do absolutely wonders for your organisation. Yeah, absolutely. I so agree. And, you know, some people think it may be a compromise to have learning online, but I actually think there's more advantages than disadvantages. Yeah, it's just, you know, I think especially in this day and age, it is how people learn. You know, if you want to learn how to um, poach an egg, <laughs> I use that example because I know it's easy, but I'm <laughs> terrible at it. So say you want to learn how to poach an egg, how to make the best poach egg, you Google it, you know, you'll look, it's you know, on your fingertips there and then, just in time learning. There's a YouTube video that you can watch, there's someone step by step, so again, whatever you prefer, you check it out, you know, and, and then you've got the perfect poached egg. Like, exactly, just like that. Yeah, imagine having to wait like three weeks to go on a course to watch someone like do a face-to-face -face demo and learn it in that environment for you to be able to pick up that piece of knowledge. Like that's just not how we work anymore. You know, we're almost quite greedy in terms of like we want all the learning and we want it now. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I think having a more digital approach to learning and having that online presence within a company, I think it's certainly more beneficial for their employees as well and how they learn. So, yeah. And if you're like, if you're a bit scared of technology, I know it can feel like a bit of a barrier sometimes, but um, it's, it's really sort of easy to overcome, I would say, because again, there's loads of little tips and bits and bobs that you can do to make yourself a bit more tech savvy as a person. And I'm sure um, as a facilitator at Rich, you sort of get people ready for us, you'll, you'll tell them how to set it up. You'll give them advice on where to sit, what they're yeah. going to need. So, you know, you can really support people in terms of adapting to this online world. Now comes the time we're going to look at our bingo board and see how we've done. I was going to say, fingers crossed that I get my hands on some of this gorgeous merch so I can, like, rock my little T-shirt or a mug. I do need a new coffee mug or something. So. Oh, let's see then. Let's see how we've done. All right, let's reveal then. Let's see what you did. Well, I can reveal you got the word experience. <laughs> that is your first one. Mm -hmm. 
The second one you got was development. Ooh. So congratulations on that. Thank you. The next one you got was adult learning theory. Ooh. Okay. Wouldn't it be great if you'd have got the fourth one as well? Because that means you'd have got a line already. So take it by that response that I didn't get that one. <laughs> you certainly did. Yay! So you've already won the mug. <laughs> well done, well done. But we've got more to reveal as well. Oh, wow. Okay. You also got... Blended. I squeezed that in at the end. At the end, yeah, well done. And the next one you got, and you said this one a few times, was interactive. Yeah, I do love that word. Yeah. It, do you know what? It's what our work's all about, isn't it, really? Okay, the next one you got was adult learner. Woohoo! Yeah. And the next one was. Design. How could you not get that one? The next one you got was PowerPoint. Ah, I didn't even realise I said that one. Yeah, <laughs> only only the once, but you said it. Yeah. yeah. The next one, and you said this one a few times actually, collaboration. Now I just want to remind you that Debbie scored ten. What am I on so far? Me trying to be Debbie. I'm like, what have I got? <laughs> you are currently on 10. Oh. And I can reveal, Heather McClinton, your score is 10. <laughs> <laughs> so you've actually drawn with Debbie. What are the chances? Seriously. I told you Debbie was really good. So she was going to be hard to beat. So I'm actually really happy to share my spot on the leaderboard. I think it's absolutely hilarious. You know, you're both oh. number one spot. That's so funny. The thing is, though, you've actually got a line. So it means you do get uh, you do get the mug. OK, oh. you get a mug. But you've also got more than six squares. The deal is if you get more than six squares, you get the T-shirt. So Heather, you're going away with more prizes. You're going away with a mug and the T-shirt. Yeah! Yeah! And it will be really handy on my upcoming virtuals next week. Oh, fabulous. In my T-shirts as well. <laughs> Thank you so much, Richard. It's been so much fun. Do you know what? It's been great to talk to you. It's been great to, to listen to your expertise and to share your knowledge. And for me, you've really given a brilliant insight into your world. So I, I'm sure a lot of our subscribers will, will feel the same, that you've really given an insight. So not just about the world that you're in, but, but how, to, how to enter that world and, and what to do in their own organisation. So thank you so much for sharing. It's been brilliant. So funny. Thank you so much for letting me play. Um, so now obviously contestant number three has got a really hard job because they've got to knock me and Debbie off I that know. <laughs> the pressure, the pressure. Well, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day and thank you for joining Bingo View. Thank you. You too. Bye. Bye. <laughs> what a shocker. I never thought that would be an outcome. Heather scored exactly the same as Debbie so shares the number one spot on the leaderboard. Heather does, however, get two gifts out of her game, but she also shared her gift with us, her expertise of instructional design in this world of virtual learning. Heather, thank you so much. It's been a blast. So who's next? Is that number one slot big enough for three? Or will the next player steal the spot? Could it be someone you know? Could it be you? Stay tuned and all will be revealed. Bye for now.